Well, good morning, everybody. A uh, special word of welcome to everybody at the Ascent and to everybody at our Union Cross campus. Uh, so glad to be with you. Are you ready for some good news? Not only can God do what seems impossible to us, but He loves, delights to do so using you. We're going to look today at uh, one of the miracles of Jesus that is maybe best known uh, and one that is appearing in all four of the Gospels. Other than the resurrection miracle, it's the only one that appears in all four of the Gospels. And we want to turn our hearts here today because the Lord has something to say to us about uh, the urgency of our mission on the earth. And so I turn you to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13. Matthew 14, verse 13. When Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. And let's pause here and say, what was it that he'd heard? Well, he'd heard of the beheading of John the baptizer. <clears throat> so he's not only exhausted, but he's in grief. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Now when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They said to him, we have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides the women, and the children. So our nation is divided right now uh, in this uh, post-election uh, week uh, of an election that by all of the surveys that were taken was between the uh, uh, most unfavorable candidates in the history of our elections. That's what the surveys showed, regardless of where you are on that. And if there is a benefit to seeing the glaring imperfections of these two candidates for the highest position of rule in our land, if there is any benefit to that, then central to that, in my mind, is that perhaps it puts us in touch with the deeper longing that we have for a truly noble leader. Of what we really are looking for in the way in which we know we need to be led. But I think this is an opportunity for the church, for the church in America especially, an opportunity for the gospel. Because uh, what Jesus does is what no political leader could do. And in fact, it was one of the chief temptations brought against Jesus. And one of the things he had to resist was that people wanted to try to make him into an earthly king. But he was essentially saying, that's not what your deepest need is. And in many ways, our text today touches on this. And I come to it on a day in which we're celebrating missions and making uh, pledges towards missions and urging our, our whole church and the whole body of Christ everywhere to think about sharing the gospel. And we come to this really interesting phrase that Jesus uses, you give them something to eat. And that's really where I'm going to end up focusing today. But it is to say that therefore God, despite all of the seeming obstacles, really can and does want to use you for miraculous purposes. Pope John Twenty-Third once said, God may let me do very little, but of the little God lets me do, I intend to do it all. But the truth of the matter is that if God lets you do, quote, very little, then whatever it is that he has for you to do has within it miraculous and supernatural unction. 
This story of these disciples who face a crowd of probably about 15,000 people, once you count the women and the children, is a story of disciples who have had a little committee meeting and they come to Jesus and say, the day has been a good day, healed a lot of people, gotten a lot of ministry done, but now people have been here a long time and they're hungry, so we need to send them home. Um, and if you read the different Gospels, you get different nuances of the story, but what you'll realize is that they, 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 they realize they don't have the funds and they don't have the resources, and they realize, you know, people are going to get pretty surly after not eating for a while, and so we ought to strategically send them on now. And so in many ways, this is a story of the disciples coming to Jesus and telling him about this predicament. And the primary thing the Lord has been whispering to my spirit this week about this is that it never goes well for us when we come to an omnipotent God and tell him what can't be done. <laughs> it's never a good thing when we make it our uh, intention to let Jesus know just how impossible the situation actually is because nothing is impossible to God. And so here's Jesus who is not only uh, become now understood to be a miracle worker and thus all these throngs of people have gathered and followed him even when he wanted to be alone to see him work more miracles, more signs and wonders. But not only that, but this is Jesus who people have begun to recognize is taught with a different kind of authority. And so they love to hear him teach. And indeed Jesus is the greatest teacher uh, in all the earth. And so the disciples come to him and they're telling him, we ought to send these people home. And what Jesus does is he teaches them. He's not just demonstrating to them his power at this point, but now he includes them in the miracle. And the reason I think he does this is for well, probably many reasons, but a great teacher doesn't simply show a student how it is to be done. A great teacher is one who enables through the right kind of teaching a student to be able to do it. That's why when I took piano lessons as a kid, I didn't go in and watch my piano teacher play a difficult piece. I already knew she could play it. The whole point of the lesson was eventually would I be able to play it. And so when you go to a piano lesson, it's not where you can sit down and watch the piano teacher. The piano teacher watches you. So this is almost like first lesson uh, for the disciples. John the Baptist has been beheaded and there's a big shift. Everything begins to shift and change. And so as these disciples are starting out their ministry, Jesus is going to instruct them. And he tells them, you give them something to eat. Let's start with this. This is a story about hunger. It is a story that at one level is about physical hunger. It's also a story clearly about the hunger of the people to be near Jesus who was performing so many signs and wonders. So there was hunger for what Jesus had to offer them. And there's physical hunger. But you get the sense that in the midst of this hungering, that the deepest hunger, the real hunger, is not yet understood. In fact, if we were to look at the story in John chapter 6, we would see that it's not long after the feeding of the 5,000 where Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. That the deepest hunger is the hunger for Christ himself. One of, the, one of the things that becomes plain as you look at the narrative of the scripture is that people are always hungering, spiritually hungering, hungering for meaning, hungering for purpose, hungering for security, and yet their hunger is misplaced, thus the formation of idols, thus the appetite of the flesh. And so in many ways, what happens when you come to Christ and you get a revelation of Christ is that you have become in touch with what your deepest, truest hunger actually is. I've been trying to eat a little healthier in recent months, uh, which for me starts with not a big bowl of ice cream every single night. Um, 
And one of the things that people will tell you who uh, talk about nutrition, and I've definitely found this to be true, is that once you sort of get yourself off of uh, all the sugar and all the junk food and all, it, for a while your body's like, man, I'm just craving that. But once you're sort of broken free from it, it is interesting how your body starts adapting to what is a deeper hunger that's within you. It, so, you know, I'm finding myself uh, less drawn towards the unhealthy food and actually having times where uh, the mixed vegetables look really good to me. So what I'm saying is, isn't it interesting? You might say your hunger changes, but it's not so much that your hunger changes as if the more authentic hunger becomes identified. I uh, remember uh, last uh, winter when I went through a time of being really sick and I had a cold and it turned into a little bit of pneumonia. I was, I couldn't, I was having a hard time shaking it. And during that period of time when I was sick, I just remember being in touch with as much as I had certain hungers in my life and things I desired, including a better golf swing or uh, some more leisure time or whatever it might be, that what I was really in tune with was I wanted health more than any of those things. So there's a, a sense in which there is a way that God gives us a gift if he can put us in touch with what we're really hungering for. C.S. Lewis once wrote, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us, like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. I look at it this way. The flesh is attracted to things of the flesh, but the spirit is drawn to spirit. And what happens is that the appetite of the flesh can only satisfy the flesh. But when the spirit is fed, then the whole person is fed as well. Let me put it this way. A, flesh, a fleshly appetite for lust is actually a camouflage, a cover-up for the deeper spirit longing for genuine intimacy. Or the fleshly appetite for gossip is actually a cover-up for the deeper spirit longing that we all need, and that is to know that we are accepted in the beloved. The fleshly appetite for greed is just a cover-up, a camouflage for the deeper spirit desire for radical security in our lives. So if you have genuine intimacy, it's amazing how lust fades. If you have deep acceptance in Christ, gossip becomes unnecessary. And if you have radical security of knowing that you belong to God and you can never be snatched out of His hand, that you're His and you're utterly secure in that, and you're utterly secure in the fact that God's going to take care of you, then uh, how can money be an idol to you? And so it is that what we need is to be in touch with the deepest hunger. This is a story that is about hunger. John Eldridge wrote a book about desire, and he summed it up saying something awful has happened, something terrible, something worse even than the fall of man. For in that greatest of all tragedies, tragedies we merely lost paradise, and with it everything made life worth living. But what has happened since? he writes, is unthinkable. We've gotten used to it. We've broken, we're broken into the idea that this is just the way things are. The people who walk in great darkness have adjusted their eyes. And I think one of the things that was happening in this story, one of the things Jesus wants to have happen for us is that whatever darkness that we've become accommodated to, that he shines a light into it and we see that there's something else. And so wherever our hunger has been shallow, he wants to awaken us to the deepest hunger that we have of all. For in the end, Jesus is our truest and deepest desire. I believe that. And I think this fuels mission for me. And I think it's the starting point of mission, beloved, is you must understand the world is hungry. Please look beyond when sinners are in the throes of their sin. Would you, could you take the eyes of Jesus and see beyond it and realize that there's a hunger that is underneath it. It's a hunger that's misplaced. It is a hunger that is confused. 
but it's a hunger that is inside the heart of every person in the earth. We were made for God and will never be fulfilled until we're in fellowship with God. People are hungry and they don't know it. Haggai, prophesying around, prophesying around 520 B.C., was encouraging the Jewish people not to despair over the seeming inferiority of the temple that they were rebuilding compared to the Solomon uh, temple of such glory. For the Lord says, He will shake the heavens and the earth and will fill this temple with glory, the prophecy goes, that in the fact the latter glory of the second temple will exceed that of the former. And in the midst of that prophecy, Haggai makes a beautiful reference which in the New King James Version reads, they shall come to the desire of all nations. I just love that phrase. To think of Jesus as a desire of all nations. Charles Spurgeon preached about it. Oh, if the world could gather up all her right desire, if she could condense in one cry all her wild wishes, if all true lovers of mankind could condense their theories and extract the true wine of wisdom from them, it would just come to this. We want an incarnate God. And you've got the incarnate God, O oh, nations, but you know it not. We're desiring God and don't know it. Our own land is divided because our hunger is too shallow. We need a deeper hunger. We need God. And so we must not despair in a climate in which our hunger for earthly leaders lets us down, but instead let it turn us to a hunger for God. The hunger for God often begins in the midst of emptiness. If an empty stomach can make a person search out food, an empty soul can make a person seek for the living God. It's not that we want too much. It's that we want too little. The world is hungry. And the second simple observation I want to make about this text with regard to our mission is so important, and it must not be missed. It is simply this, verse 14. When he went ashore, he saw the great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. This is Jesus, who is in grief, over the beheading of John the Baptist. This is Jesus who's exhausted and wants time to rest. And this is Jesus who, as a human being, you must understand he's just as human as you and I. His body, the way that your body gets tired when you've given and given and given, and you feel like you have nothing left to give, you know that feeling? He felt that exact same thing. The time when you feel like you hadn't had enough sleep, and everything within your flesh is just like, I, I've just got to get some rest. I've got to pull away. And I've got to recharge. You've had that feeling. That's exactly what Jesus was feeling. And you've, you've experienced grief where you've seen the, the tragedies of the world. You've lost that which is very dear to you. And the idea that when you're in grief because your loved one has prematurely been taken away from this earth and you have the disappointment of that and you have the pain and the grief and the sense of loss and and the sense of anger and frustration and fighting off those feelings of denial and just trying to wrestle with it all isn't it the last time in your life that you could imagine feeling like you had something to give to somebody else what i'm saying is if you're exhausted and you're in deep grief this is a time in which you want to go and just get alone or get alone with just a few people. I want you to understand Jesus was fully God, but he's fully human. And he experienced those human emotions. It was such a day for him. And he went to a solitary place. He just tried to get away. And the crowds found him. This isn't the only time that this happened. We often note well how much Jesus was persecuted. But I think that what history also records for us that must be wrestled with is that one of the greatest problems Jesus had was his popularity. He was everywhere he went. Crowds of people wanted to be around him. 
they were drawn because they had seen miraculous signs coming through him. It was exciting, but they were also in need, and some of them needed to be healed. And they were just being drawn to this miracle worker. And so it was that Jesus had tried to get away for just a little while, and he couldn't. If you'd ever thought that there would be a figure in this story that would want to send the crowd away, you'd think it would be Jesus. But instead, it's the disciples that want to send the crowd away, and Jesus wants to keep them near. What changed? Why? And what was it that overcame his exhaustion? It's verse 14. He had compassion on them. This word in the Greek language, splangzizomai, is a reference to the bowels and the kidneys because it was the impression of people in that time that that's the seat of the deepest emotions. Well, we, we can understand what this means because if you just say, I feel it down in my gut, right? Or we'll even use the phrase a visceral reaction to something. That there's something that moves you greatly. It's, it, isn't it weird how you feel it and you almost feel it down in your gut? It's not something you just feel like it's in your brain. And so uh, these things that are hard to understand about the source of emotion and how it all works in our body, we still don't fully understand all this. But for the ancient world, they just the Greek world had this word that means to be moved and twisted and turned and gripped in your inmost being. This is not a compassion that just would pat somebody on the head or see a picture of a starving child and throw a few dollars that way. This is something that gripped Jesus and moved him and captured his full attention. One text says he saw they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That when Jesus saw people in need, he, the God-man, though physically exhausted, was spiritually consumed with an inward compassion. To have compassion means to feel with or to suffer with. And and some of you have a gift of mercy or intercession, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Is that when you get around a person, and you may not even have mentally or intellectually a knowledge of what's going on with that person's life, but the Spirit knows. And you have experienced this if you are a deep intercessor, or you have a gift of mercy, or you flow in the ministry of compassion. You probably know what, what Jesus is feeling, at least to a certain degree. You know what I'm talking about. Is that you have a, an awareness. It, it's not a mental. You feel what someone else is feeling. And it grips you. And it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a compassion that is supernatural in its origin. Because you see, God not only in Christ has experienced what it is to be human so He is able to understand you because He's been through it, but God in Jesus Christ is still God and He knows what can't be known merely intellectually. In other words, Jesus literally feels what people feel. And so he sees people that are sick. He sees family members that have brought their sick family members. Remember, they didn't have good doctors. They didn't have the good medical care we have. They didn't have hospitals. They didn't have all these wonderful gifts. They didn't have antibiotics. They just, all they knew is they just have a sick child. And he would look upon a mother of a sick child and he'd see the child. And he knew what the mother felt. And he knew what the child felt. And his heart was just, was just consumed with this compassion. That's who God is. So, so God heals unto his own glory, yes. God in Jesus Christ, he healed to <clears throat> identify himself as the Messiah, yes. But just don't lose sight of this. Jesus healed people because he loved them so much. 
Jesus cared for people because he, he couldn't do otherwise. That's who God is. Years ago, <clears throat> I know I've shared this story long ago, but it came back to mind. I was pastoring in a church in Durham, and I had gone to the hospital to visit a dear older man named Lester. And by this time, the cancer was in his bones, and it hurt so bad that it seemed to bring Lester some relief where he would moan with this characteristic moan and he exhale and say, Oh, me. Oh, me. And his grown son came to the hospital while I was there. And he came to the hospital bed next to his dad. And he held his hand. And Lester let out that characteristic long moan. Oh, me. And I was taken aback to watch his grown son, this kind man, lean down towards his father and repeat back to him, Oh, me, in a little almost childlike voice. And he did this several times. And I, at first, was aghast. I thought, is it possible that a grown son is mocking his dying father's moan? But soon I found out. I stepped out in the hallway, and he explained that <clears throat> Lester had a little grandson named Wesley, who, a uh, little blonde-haired boy, and when they were, before he'd been hospitalized and Lester was at home and he was in such pain, but he would at times get up and use his walker and he would take a step and each step hurt. And so Lester would go, oh me. And one day little Wesley, toddler, was over at the house and came over and put his, put his hand on the bottom of the walker to help his granddaddy walk. And Lester would say, oh, me. And little Wesley would help and go, oh, me. And so it was that that's the scene at the hospital that day. He wasn't mocking his father's moan. He was reminding him of a little blonde-haired boy to whom compassion came so easily and so naturally. There's something in the heart of God that so feels what you feel that there is from the Holy Spirit when people are hurting also an oh me. He knows what you feel. If we're going to be a people of mission, we need to know the world is hungry and Jesus is compassionate. And if you can look past the superficiality and the ways in which people express their hunger and remember there's a deeper hunger underneath it and ask God for the grace to have His compassionate heart, then you'll find yourself wanting the people to be fed. The third obstacle that would keep the disciples, and the most obvious that would keep them from being able to feed the people, is they didn't see any way that it was possible. <laughs> Such an irony that the biggest uh, part of this miracle really had nothing to do with anything that the disciples would do, because Jesus himself is the one who orchestrates the miracle. Jesus is the one who had faith for the miracle. Jesus is the one who multiplies the bread and the fish. But <clears throat> the disciples are used by Jesus here, even though we must say Jesus didn't need to use them. Um, God 
used these disciples who didn't think they could be used by God. <laughs> That's just it's very encouraging to me. Because what it means to me is that the times that I didn't think God could use me, that somehow I was disqualified, God didn't think I was disqualified. You're qualified not by your merits, but you're qualified by Christ. And Christ believes in you more than you believe in yourself. He made you. And he died for you. Please note, these are the kind of people that he used. So after the disciples had their little committee meeting, and they decided, here's what we need to do. We need to go over and tell Jesus. We need to send this crowd away. And uh, they come to tell him. And Jesus just simply says, uh, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Uh, in other uh, gospel renditions of this, there's a phrase we don't have in Matthew. He says, what do you have, <laughs> essentially? Now, there's a sense in which God loves, in this teaching lesson for the disciples, to not only use them when they thought they couldn't be used, but to start with something that was really small. Remember, God invented the seed. He built this whole world on the principle of the seed. Something that looks so insignificant, yet has inherent within it fullness of life once it is able to grow. And that growth then produces fruit that has within it more seed. He's a God who wants us to learn from the days of small beginnings and learn from seeds. Because we're so prone to wait, to think, until we have something big to offer, we shouldn't offer it. Until we have something grandiose to demonstrate, we shouldn't let it be seen. But that's not the way it is with God. If you have the tiniest little gift of faith, then pray it. If you have the tiniest little sense of generosity, give it. If you have a seed within you that says, I... I want to share the gospel with some. Share it. Let's see. It's a principle. The seed that stays in the hand doesn't produce. But the seed that goes into the ground can produce a harvest that is exponential. It's the way of God. Notice that the miracle happened as they began. So often, right? God has a step into the water and then the water parts. Just start handing out the food. It's all part of their training. That in the years to come, essentially Jesus is saying, you're going to face problems for which you believe there are no resources to cover that problem. This is a very small thing right here. This is just natural food for people. But you're going to come to a time in ministry and life in which there's going to be a spiritual hunger. And there's going to be a hunger all around you that you have nothing in yourself that can satisfy but what I want you to see, Jesus says, today as we start this lesson, is that as you begin to release what you do have, I am going to provide miraculously what needs to be provided. There are going to be times where you'll be brought up before authorities and you won't know what to say. Start speaking and I'll give you the words. There are going to be times in which there will be people who are sick and you'll have no faith. You won't know what to do. You lay hands on them and I will do the miracle. He's given them a lesson. John chapter 6, in referencing the story, ends with this, perceiving after the miracle that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. As if to say that Jesus is pointing here, not just to look at the sign, look at the wonder, but what he was ultimately pointing to was he's pointing to himself as the bread of life. Because what I want you to understand ultimately, students, Jesus is saying to his disciples, is not just that I can do the miracle, but I am the miracle. Not just that I can provide the bread, but I am the bread. And that as long as you have me with you, there shall be nothing that is impossible. So you go ahead and give them something to eat. I'm saying the world is hungry, starving, and they're acting out in foolish ways out of their hunger it is a misplaced hunger and we have 
the bread of life to offer them in Christ. And Jesus is compassionate. He feels what people feel. I want the compassion of Jesus. It fuels the mission. And Jesus says, you can feed them. doesn't have to use us. But every time he uses us, he's teaching us about himself. The great missionary Hudson Taylor, who opened up the gospel in China, once journaled, once wrote that there were three stages he had found in any attempted work that he'd done for God. Three stages. Impossible, difficult, done. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that almost anything that God's going to do is great at first seems impossible, and then it just seems difficult. And then one day you look back, and it was done. We've got to feed the world. We've got to care for the world. People need Jesus. Fred Craddock, who has been listed as one of the great preachers of the last uh, century, who was such a great storyteller and really taught a lot of students preaching about how preaching is not just three points in a pro poem, but it is oftentimes a narrative that takes us and transports us into the world of Jesus. He was such a wonderful man. He one time preached a sermon and then had on this text and had communion afterwards. And after communion had been served, he's reported to have looked out at the congregation and said, has everybody been fed? And um, the ushers kind of looked around and nodded at him. Yes. And he said it again. Has everyone been fed? The people looked at each other. Yeah, yeah. They nodded their heads. And, yes. He said to their time, has everyone been fed? And he let it grow quiet so they could hear the cars driving by on the road outside. And they could have time to begin to think about their friends who didn't know the Lord. And family members who were in despair. And they realized, no, we've been fed. But not everybody's been fed. God is going to use you. And that's the gospel.